Language is not life. It gives life orders. Today, we're going to talk about words. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Flickr Theory Reviews. I'm your host, Tadas Vinokur. Before I begin, I just want to say Happy New Year's, everybody. I hope you're going to have a, a fantastic one. I also want to ask you guys to consider subscribing to this channel because that would really help me uh, make this channel grow. Anyway, today uh, we are looking at a different, different chapter from A Thousand Plateaus by the name of Postulates of Linguistics. In my opinion, this is an uh, extremely important chapter of A Thousand Plateaus because it connects Deleuze and Guattari's thought to more language-oriented branches of post-structuralism, such as uh, deconstruction, for example. Here, Deleuze and Guattari discuss uh, the ways in which humans organize themselves socially through symbolic structures. They do this by critiquing uh, four main postulates of representational linguistics. I will list them in order. Number one, language is informational and communicational. Number two, language should be understood as separate from extrinsic factors or objective reality. Number three, language possesses certain constants or universals that makes it a homogeneous system. And number four, language can only be studied scientifically uh, by focusing on a standard or a major language. Well, today I'm going to be looking at these postulates closely and I will explain how Deleuze and Guattari approach every single one of them. So let's get going. The first postulate claims that language is informational and communicational. In other words, this postulate assumes that the language we speak efficiently transfers information or truth, if you will. This implies that the structure of language allows for a connection uh, with the objective world out there, like extrinsic, uh, extrinsic world that is around us and it communicates the possibilities of that objective world uh, to us. Well, Deleuze and Guattari disagree with this postulate. In fact, they think that language is not communicational. Instead, the whole point of language is to transfer what they call uh, order words. Order words. They claim that the elementary unit of language is the order word. They give us an example of a school teacher who, according to them, does not inform or educate, but instead transmits uh, these order words. So what are the order words? What are they? Here, we can tie this idea of order words to J.L. Austin and his philosophy of language. Austin coined the term uh, speech acts, which defines statements that initiate some kind of an action when they are proclaimed. In, in other words, a speech act is an utterance that has a performative function. So for example, uh, when a judge says, you are convicted of a crime, uh, that statement commands a performative function in a form of uh, the accused becoming a convict. Now, for the losing Qatari, order words do not communicate something seen or experienced. Instead, they comment on something that has been said already, which means that language uh, functions like hearsay or rumor. Uh, in language, the importance of the indefinite a third pronoun becomes really pronounced in that language is always about what one supposedly did or said or saw. Finally, we should discuss what Deleuze and Guattari call uh, the collective enunciative assemblage. This means that there is no such thing as a personal language. Language is shared within a collective assemblage. For example, different regions and cultures will have different order words. Collective enunciative assemblage determines the ways in which order words uh, affect our daily lives, whether they impose corporeal change on us or not. In summation, then, Deleuze and Guattari think that language does not communicate information, but rather it orders life. To quote them, language is not life. It gives life orders. The second postulate assumes that language should be understood as separate from extrinsic factors. In other words, this postulate assumes that language does not interact with extrinsic factors or objective factors. It functions on its own. I will discuss 
uh, the losing guitarist critique of the second postulate by explaining their perspective towards Chomsky's notion of uh, the deep grammatical structure. Noam Chomsky revolutionized the field of linguistics by developing the idea of uh, the deep uh, grammatical structure, which is uh, innate to individuals and allows for apprehension of language. This grammatical structure, according to Chomsky, is separated from extrinsic factors. The losing Atari disagree with this. They think that Chomsky is making a mistake by separating language from extrinsic objective factors. The losing Atari think that language should be interpreted even more abstractly than Chomsky sees it. Language for the losing Atari is not arborescent uh, structure of discrete units that don't have any relation to extrinsic or uh, objective world. Language for them is, is rhizomatic and that is always open to relations and influences from the outside. Here we should mention the dualism of form and content. For Deleuze, form or expression is not totally separated from content. These two poles interact, they bounce off each other. Deleuze and Atari are able to envision this interaction by making a distinction between corporeal modifications of content and incorporeal transformations of expression. Content and expression are, however, not understood as parallel to each other. In fact, they are both positioned on a horizontal plane. The ways in which content and expression uh, change are regulated by uh, degrees of deterritorialization. To quote Deleuze and Gattari, there are degrees of deterioration that quantify the respective forms and according to which contents and expression are conjugated, feed into each other, accelerate each other, or on the contrary become stabilized and perform a reterritorialization. In short, the way an expression relates to content is not by uncovering or representing it. Rather, forms of, or forms of expression and forms of content communicate through a conjugation conjunction of their quanta of relative deterioration, each intervening and operating in the other. In other words, Deleuze and Gattari perceive language as a rhizome that affects and is affected by the processes of expression and content, by corporeal and incorporeal deterioralizations. The third postulate assumes that language possesses certain constants or universals that makes it a homogeneous system. In other words, we can only study languages scientifically if languages are taken to be homogeneous systems. This way, languages are assumed to possess constants or universals that make them stable and unified. Well, Deleuze and Gattari disagree with this. I mentioned already Chomsky's account of deep grammatical structure in language. Here, I should mention Chomsky's disagreement with William uh, Leiboff, another American linguist who perceived, differently than Chomsky, language as a system of variation, not something homogeneous, universal or constant. William Leiboff thinks that uh, what is more important in language is not the constants, but the variations in language that various different contexts and speakers uh, create. Well, in Chomsky's opinion, Leiboff is simply talking about pragmatics, a branch of linguistics that deals with language uh, in use and contexts in which it is used. Uh, Deleuze and Gattari, in fact, think that language cannot be separated from pragmatics. For them, uh, language is not defined by constants, uh, but by lines of continuous uh, variation that are different, that are different within each language. Such an attitude towards language embraces the creative capacity of language and stops uh, treating language as a static, homogeneous system. Language evolves through continuous uh, variation of intensive uh, assemblages. Finally, only if we understand language as though it was based on continuous structural variation and dissemination of variables, only then can linguistics uh, become creative. The fourth postulate assumes that language can only be studied scientifically by focusing on standard or major languages. In other words, this postulate claims that there is a standard language that can bring linguistic variation uh, that is studied by pragmatics uh, under the homogeneous conditions of standard, standardized language. Deleuze and Qatari again think that this is wrong. In fact, 
Luz and Gattari think that standardization of language is also a political manifestation of power, in that certain uh, rules or order words are forced on people that may speak a non-standard language. For Luz and Gattari, standard languages and non-standard languages can be differentiated only by virtue of the fact that standard uh, languages are meant to be constant, static, while non-standard languages are inevitably based more on the power of variation. Again, for Deleuze and Gattari, the idea of standard language is political. If, for example, a language is declared to be the official language of the state, this declaration immediately creates subordinate languages uh, of the minority. To quote Deleuze and Gattari, minorities are objectively definable states states of language, ethnicity, or sex with their own ghetto territorialities. But they must also be thought as of as seeds, crystals of becoming, whose value is to trigger uncontrollable movements and deterritorializations of the majority. For the losing Gattari, linguistics is a field that often benefits from standardization of language. However, this standardization obstructs creative capacities of language and excludes minority languages. With this chapter, Deleuze and Gattari simple, uh, simply state four things. For them, language is neither informative or communicative. Language appeals to extrinsic factors. Language forms a heterogeneous system. And also, for them, language does not need a standard language to be studied. Thank you so much. See you next time.